welcome once again to our 13th episode of the heresy accountability buddies uh my name is john and tonight i'm joined by dan duncan jack jamie, jamie. <laughs> We're just going to keep going through that. We can never we, make a good intro. We will so, never, ever have a proper intro. That sounds good. It's it's a great meme, like many other things we'll talk about later. Oh, so, God. First up, <laughs> we've got uh, Hobby Progress. Uh, like usual, I'll go ahead and kick us off. I managed to get, uh, I had a, a bunch of work meetings, but I managed to get all of the um, spot colors down on the jet bikes and the jet bike riders and infantry batches that i've been painting uh and then i'm got home and sealed them all so everything is ready to go uh tonight i'll be basing those jet bikes and riders and making sure that everything works correctly and then i can move on to oil washes and then past oil washes as golds and then finishing them all up uh for what was going to be for me music city heresy but uh, finances have taken a different turn the last couple weeks uh with a car accident and some other stuff so I'm going to be missing Music City Heresy, but I'm still going to be painting like I'm going. So that's the important part. Uh, so they'll get their debut at Warzone Houston. Uh, Game-wise, nothing much. Other hobby-wise, I spent the last four hours sending a 1911 to make a custom slide fit on it. That was silly. You know, covered in metal shavings. Um, but that's everything for me. Duncan, what about you? Oh, uh, well, last week I had uh, Jack build a uh, pair of Land Raider Proteuses for me because I didn't have the time or the ability to do that uh this week i have uh finished the first one of the sons of horus land reader proteuses um here's the second one that obviously no one who's listening can see because i'm holding it up and this is not an audio a video cast but um other than a seal the various golds for the spot trim bits that i'm doing and the weathering and the final seal and the decals it's done so uh that's two land raider produces in a week which is considering how this week's been for me pretty damn good um i guess uh monday i will try to get started on this latch last batch of uh reavers for music city heresy and then maybe if i'm lucky i'll have time to finish 10 tactical support guys with volkite calibers if not, I'll just finish the bases for everybody and throw another dread in there. But uh, that's all I've got. So next, I can get I'll jump jump in. So um, I don't have tons of progress. So I uh, haven't recorded the last time we recorded. I spent a week in uh, Boundary Waters up in literally God's country. Nobody around. It was amazingly incredible and a ton of work. Um, but it was awesome. Uh, but then since I got back, I put together an assault squad. So I now have a full assault squad and a tactical squad together uh, and primed. Um, I also pre-ordered the new kill team box, which because it's got just a crap ton of Space Hulk slash Zone Mortalis walls in it. And I like the, uh, the Imperial Navy models um it kind of as a heresy adjacent thing i think that a lot of times people put together custom uh missions where you have to escort um npcs around and i think they'll make really really cool npc models for uh for missions like that so i'm going to use basically all except for the crew models out of it for heresy uh, so i put that pre-order in at the game store um, and now I am working on, as we speak, taking the bionic bits off of Zephon because I want my Zephon to just be a generic uh, Raider rather than Zephon. So I didn't want the um, bionic stuff on it. So that's what I've got. Um, hope to finish the Kratos this week um, and start getting some color down on my tactical unit and assault squad. So Jack, what you got? Sounds like you both um, Land Raiders. <laughs> It's a, it's been a slow week for me with uh, everything going on with work. Um, yay, National River Float Day and all the prep for that. Um, so I've worked on a Xiphon uh, that is ready to be de deckled. Uh, and I'm currently working on two Land Raiders uh, to get them to the point to being ready to get deckled. Um, and that's about all I've managed to get done this week. Let's double click on that River Float Day as a fat man. Expand. Expand. Uh, well, AW decided 
um, I don't know, years and years and years ago, is that, uh, that August the 6th is National River Float Day. And with that, we partner with a uh, generally DAV, Dis Disabled American uh, Veterans, and we take donations for uh, floats. And, it, you know, you give do donations and you get a free float. Basically, that's how it's generally ran for the most part. That's cool. Neat. I thought yeah. it was more like the 7-Eleven, like everyone gets cheaper, but that's really cool for doing it the charity Great. way. I wish, yeah, I, yeah. Wish, I wish I'd we, known. I had to try to find a local A and W uh, and it, 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 it's, it's a national thing, but it's still based upon the if the local franchise partner wants to do it. Yeah, cool. That's really cool. So, what about you, Mr. Jamie? Um, so kind of like Dan, last time we recorded, uh, I was down on the Gulf Coast, went to Gulf Shores, Alabama, uh, go camping down there frequently with the, or excuse me, glamping down there with the family and uh so i kind of had a week or two week and a half off of not doing anything and then this week i've been this weekend specifically like past two days um it's uh jamie's rhino emporium um i've built six mark 1c hulls they're not all rhinos some of them were like whirlwind scorpiuses and then a regular kind of a the as we were talking about earlier, me and Dan were talking about earlier, the like 130 to 150 plus dollar Rhino um, hull. It's a GW hull with the Forge World added armor. Like uh, then it had Dark Angel doors on it, a Forge World dozer blade, and then a Forge World uh, Damocles uh, command add on parts. So yeah, it's probably the most expensive rider you're going <laughs> to ever see on a tabletop. But uh, I painted one of them because it's been a while since I painted any rhinos. So I kind of like did a tester haul kind of to get the paint job down for the other, you know, five or six that I've got finished. Plus I had to, there was two rhinos that I had already built and painted that apparently one of my kids had gotten into black paint at some point and ruined the, well, splash black, like chaos black paint on some of the red and white parts of the tanks that I have because they're dark angel colors. So I had to go back and touch all that back up. So like, yeah, literally like all I've been doing is rhinos, 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 and more rhinos. And I'll probably, this week it's supposed to rain a lot here. So I'm going to try and see if I can actually maybe prime most of them tonight before, after we get finished recording. So that I can work on them during the week. That that was me. Cool. So anybody got any games played while we're at it before we move on? Sadly not. Okay. No problems. I guess next up, um, we've got a couple of topics we wanted to discuss tonight. The main one that I'd kind of been mulling over as I've been taking all these work trips is traveling and painting. Uh, one of the big things that, you know, if you're coming up to an event or you're trying to to pad your paint time is trying to squeeze in either an hour a night or a couple hours a night every time you can as you get ready for an event just to keep the, the momentum up or to keep uh, constant work on your hobby and, you know, constant work. Well, they say, how do you get to Carnegie Hall is a thousand hours of practice over a thousand or 10,000 hours of practice and a thousand hours of uh, teaching. So uh, what I've done is I've kind of built up a travel hobby kit that I take to events and then a different kit that I take or take one to, to work events and I take one to gaming events. So the gaming events one kind of started life as what my dad and I used to call, let me use one of our PG-13 labels, uh, a box. So that is every color that has touched the army will be in the box. And then a collection of brushes. Uh, I usually use um, cheap Hobby Lobby. Uh, it's five brushes for or uh, used to be three dollars. I think now it's five or six dollars. But they're ho miniature hobby brushes. Um, I throw those in the box. I throw glue and accelerator and uh, a couple of tweezers, uh, a bunch of extra paper towels. Pretty much anything that goes, you know, anything that would work for the army for breaking or anything like that. I can put the army back together as fast as possible. Um, that is a great way to kind of start looking at travel painting. So if you're going to a painting event like Adepticon or something like that, there's going to be paints there. So you don't necessarily need to think about bringing your own paints if you're going to be painting an army or uh, your own blues maybe and things like that. Uh, but if you're looking at, you know, like a work trip or something like that, then you've got to think, what can I logically get done in the time that I'm allotted? So for me this last week, I was in uh, mm -hmm. San Antonio, Texas, and I had... Uh, I got there Sunday night, uh, Monday and Tuesday was a big event day for work. I didn't get home till 10 or 11, leaving later on Tuesday. 
uh, and then Wednesday night was or Wednesday was check out and then head home. So I had those three kind of night evening nights to work on painting. So I figured I could get all of the brown trim on the jet bikes and all of the silver down the jet bikes if I pushed myself. So I was able to get half the metal done on night one, the second half of the metal done on night two, and then the brown seats were all done on night three, and then the brown trim was done with the marker on night three. So I was able to get all that done those three nights. So the only things I brought along in my pack was um, good old Vallejo Metal Color Magnesium, uh, the Gundam Marker Brown that I use. It's got two different ends. It's a real touch marker number uh, 407 uh, for 200 yen, which ends up being about five, six, uh, eight bucks US. And then um, Leather Brown AK Interactive uh, Paint. And so those were the three things that I brought along with the set of brushes. And I knew that I could get all those bikes done. I wrapped the bikes up in uh, tissue paper and extra battle foam and put them in a shipping box and then put it in my truck with all my luggage. And so when I got to the got to the hotel, I unpacked you know my normal suitcase, got everything laid out. And then I went to the table that's there. I laid down, a, every hotel gives you a pack of paper. I take all that paper apart, put all the stickies back to back so I can make myself a painting surface. And then away I go. So it allows me to not damage anything that's in the hotel. It allows me to, to quickly brush paint uh, when I am painting larger surface areas like the the jet bikes uh, top sponson or top uh, metal coils, I'm kind of a little um, a little fast when I'm doing that because I know I can be wasteful with the paint. <clears throat> and I know it applies fairly quickly when I'm doing that, so I'll get a little bit of spray with that. And I didn't want anything to get on the hotel stuff and get charged for that. Um, when it came time for the browns, obviously that's where I was being a lot more careful, uh, as it's the base coat for a lot of the metals and also the seats. Um, the other things to look for when you're traveling like that i have a travel light i bought a variable four power usb powered light um that allows me to increase uh, lighting when i'm in a hotel because a lot of them are very dark in the corners which is usually where you're going to end up painting um i also try to bring along a phone stand and a multi-charger so i've got a usb it's a plug-in that has uh, eight usb plugs in it so one can go to my phone one can go to my work laptop one can go to my battery backup, which I take as I go throughout the day, and then one can go to the light. And so that way I can keep everything close together as I'm working. I've got a phone stand that I keep. That's a collapsible phone stand I can throw in my bag. Uh, and in the bag for all my painting stuff, I've found um, either battle foam or whatever your, your foam vendor of choice is. Usually a skirmish size uh, army bag is probably the best one. So that way you've got enough room for the tools that you're going to use. Maybe the light can go in there as well as in the the collapsible phone stand. Everything that I take for painting all fits in my one battle foam. Uh, the one I've got is a Malifo bag. One side is a D-ring binder. The other side is um, the zipper foam. So I've got pluck picked out for my brushes, for the pots of paint that I'm going to take, no more than four. Uh, and then the light lays in there as well as a bunch of cables. And on the D-ring side, I've got extra paper towels in case I don't like what the what, what the hotel has. Um, and a bunch of other little essentials that I that I might find uh, some extra paper so I can build my own painting area if I don't like what the hotel has. So that's what I use when I travel to events. Uh, does anybody else have anything that they like to take along with them? So one of the things I find you talked about the travel light. I have, and I'm showing it in the chat here where you guys can see it, but um, the listeners won't be able to. But basically, it's a little work light. So it's LED, so it's really bright and battery powered. It's actually magnetic on the bottom, so you can stick it on to uh, whatever you want to and it'll stay um, stuck there. Um, and I actually at Adepticon, I had was doing some painting and I brought one of these in because even though like the big room where you're playing games is pretty well lit in the grand scheme of things, for close up stuff, it's not really. And I even found myself, because I'm getting bad, worse at close-up eyesight stuff sometimes with that not being real bright, I was even using it when I was looking at paint jobs when we were um, evaluating armies so I could pick up a, you know, or shine the light on it. Um, but it's um, real handy. You don't have to have a USB or anything. Just make sure you have AA batteries. And it was like there were like four of them in a pack from Costco for like 20 bucks or something when I bought them. And I originally bought them to use to work on cars. And I still do that when I work on my truck. Uh, but I also carry one around for, uh, for hobby um, painting. Um, I have not put a permanent kit together like you talk about because 
I am in a Kickstarter that I hope at some point in time will actually deliver for a full travel painting studio that they actually were at Adepticon demoing or had a demo unit. Um, I'm not sure the Kickstarter was originally scheduled to be March of 21. So they're quite a far, quite a ways behind. Um, but I'm hoping if that ever comes, that has a space for like 30 paints and some models and has a brush hanger that you can slide in and out and hangs your brush upside down and a little small wet palette in a case with a light to it. I'm really looking for that. Other than that, um, if I go to, I've been to a number of painting classes that I travel to and I just take a big tote, you know, just a, you know, like, a, I don't know, a, you know, three foot by two foot by two foot tote or something like that. And I put my normal LED light and just all of my stuff in the tote and carry it along with me. Yeah, I had, like, when I go to events, I always take kind of like a, as it, you know, a hit, a shit hit the fan type uh, kit with me that has uh, glue, accelerant, uh, a pen vise with different size pen, you know, different size drill bits and some uh, uh, good clippers and some, like, cheap, you can get, like, a big old cheap set of files that are good for resin at Harbor Freight and uh some materials for to make pens like in case like break arms and stuff and some like basic touch-up paints and cheap brushes and like a little tiny like harbor freight toolbox that's not very large but it can keep everything in there just and you know depending on what armies i have it will change the paints out for what's needed just kind of like emergency type repairs yeah that's where oh, yeah. the box just, that i mainly use is that, that that black and silver one that latches on the corners that's the one i use from harbor freight yeah, I think, yeah, mine's like, I want to say black and yellow, and it's got a couple small little container trays up the top, and I'll actually will throw in some, like, extra dice and maybe, like, templates if, you know, if they'll fit in there, like the the, the small blast templates and the flame templates, too, so just if I have, if I need an extra set. So you mentioned, you mentioned pinning material. I'm curious, do you actually buy like brass pinning material or anything? Because... No, I, I, I'm the, one of the guys that uses a uh, stainless steel, uh, paper clips and cut okay. them up i was gonna say because i i have a couple of things where i've pinned where a paper clip wouldn't work that was very small but i generally yeah i buy i just um, buy paper clips at the hardware store or the office supply store and just yeah. bend them out and that's, yeah, what, I, pin that's models what i do corks and bases and everything else like that the only so thing I, you got to be careful of is that when you're cutting them if you're using good clippers you're going to absolutely destroy them <laughs> i i have a set of needle nose with a yeah. A wire clipper attachment yeah. that are specifically my bend and cut paper clip <laughs> i just want to i want to preface that before anybody goes and tries yeah. to cut uh yeah. like clip with uh, their good nippers or something or like god hand clippers or something yeah. don't yeah, do I, that i just i just spent the 40 dollars and got the god hand clippers from uh john and you're right i could picture someone because I, I think you'd just snip the clippers off if you tried to do a paper clip with those hey, i've i've seen many people that have broken god hands because they're like oh uh, i needed a clip pair of clippers and i just grabbed these because they're close by and even even the citadel ones i think you'd probably yeah. break on a paper clip it depends on which one but yes i mean uh there's I mean, they're, they're decent enough clippers but not for that yeah i've got I need citadels for paper clips and, and it works fine I've got this pair right here that's green handled, this arteal handle. I've been using this one for, uh, I want to say, 20 years now. <laughs> God, I'm feeling old. Yeah. Uh, when I started when I was 15. So, yeah, I've been using the same pair of wire cutters for all my pins uh, that whole time. I feel like an absolute idiot because I hear you all talk about paper clips. And I've been using um, segmented roofing nails and just cutting them along the clips because they're very rigid. They bend easily. They clip easily. And they can hold darn near anything together when you need to, to uh, pin them that said most of the time when i'm pinning stuff it's larger things like dreads yeah. and not uh dudes so yeah if i so i would that actually brings up an interesting discussion with with paper clips is they make segmented paper clips they make normal paper clips yeah. and they make plastic coated and oddball shapes and all that stuff um i go back and forth between segmented and not segmented paper clips depending on thickness that i need um the other thing that i've started using specifically for pinning the jet bikes and things like that is if you go to Hobby Lobby or any other real kind of crafting place, they have 16 gauge steel or brass wire. Uh, and that is usually about one and a half thickness of a paper clip. Uh, and if I'm pinning 
deep things like heavy duty stuff i'll use that but otherwise i'll use three or four steel paper clips like the the flying bases on my thunderbolts every bar of that cross all four of them have two inch long steel paper clips in them from the base into the from the resin base into those flight stands yeah sometimes when i get one thicker when i'm doing bigger stuff like that i'll use the the bigger paper clips which are thicker around than the standard size paper clips um yeah. but yeah i and i've had i've done a few things where i've used smaller wire where i've gotten you know the brass wire from the hobby store that they use for ho train stuff and various things and that's when you're pinning a you know a, a hammer shaft together because it's busted twice and you don't want it to bust again or something like that and you know but for the most part yeah i uh paper clips are just and, and they're cheap right i mean 200 paper clips is a buck 99 or something like that I, so yeah cool anything else on travel y'all want to expand on uh yeah the uh the primary travel kit that i carry with me is normally a pocket knife and uh a jack <laughs> Because I mean, he's got everything in his pile of stuff, <coughs> and oh, I just, uh, I just kind of haul him around. Than, you know, the concealed carry. You know, that's not going to help you put models back together. If I, if I recall, or correct, someone to put stuff together. If I, if I recall correctly, you also have a bunch of AL eight that you can just trade for other people's hobby tools if you have. To <laughs> I, exactly. Yeah, there is that. I mean, that's part of it. It's uh, I carry the alcohol, I carry the soda, and I carry my buddy Jack, and. uh if I need something, if if somehow I didn't bring a thing of glue that's still sitting in my hobby bag over here um, with me whenever I go to whatever, and I don't have a, the knife that I need, um, I look at Jack and I'm like, hey, where's your blah, 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 and it magically appears out of the sack of stuff that he has with him. It's it's like a miracle. <laughs> Jack is my travel tote. I hate you so much. <laughs> I know you do, and that's my favorite part of this whole thing. I, my cat just laid down on my keyboard. Jack, how do you build a travel tote to supply both yourself and Duncan? <laughs> uh, <laughs> First of all, did you realize that your travel hobby supply kit was Duncan's as well? <laughs> um, the moment he borrowed my super glue to, I think, I think fix the brake on his trucks, I realized that. Um, I wish that was a joke. I'm pretty sure he super glued his brakes onto his truck at one point. Uh, it wasn't the brakes. It was the handle that had popped off of the actual brake relief. Inside. Okay. Whatever. Whatever l lets you sleep at night, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, what I normally do is I just keep it simple. I do super glue. I do accelerant. I don't worry about any paint or anything like that. The biggest thing I try to keep up with is all the bits and pieces that may break off during a con. Um, I'm generally too busy, hyped up on caffeine to try to put stuff together on a regular basis. So I just try to make sure I have stuff on me so I don't lose any of the bits and bobs that I spent all this time sourcing and finding. So that's me. Yeah, that's the big thing is trying to make sure you find everything. I The the uh, the, the box really came from a ho a, my hobby used to be um, you know, scale modeling. And whenever you get to an event, sometimes a judge would pick up a model and break it or something, or they'd, someone didn't touch it wrong. And um, the other thing that I remember was uh, I was at the Dallas GT 2001, and a guy was trying to open his door and carry his Blood Angel army on a tray at the same time. And we can all uh, think of what happened after that. That sounds horrible. Yeah, it went one way. Um, the door handle went one way and the army went the other. So um, that poor man ended up spending the rest of that night gluing everything back together instead of drinking with everybody else. So uh, I wanted to make sure that would never be me. And <laughs> that's why I bring extra glue and everything else usually when i go to events unless it's local then i obviously forget everything and i'm lucky if i bring my dice in myself so <laughs> that's um isn't that most cool. local events yeah local events are, are fun but i i don't go to a ton of all right let's see here is there anything else hobby related that we uh we really haven't discussed or touched on other than uh, um so the there was probably that... we wanted to cover a couple we wanted to cover a couple other things. We're, we'll take a break from the other um, main topic that Dan and I had kind of come up with, and we'll do uh, what's coming up for releases. So uh, as of recording, we just had what's called the Sunday preview drop. So uh, next Sunday, uh, I say next Sunday, this will be actually be uh, August the 13th for, for Mortals in the future. Um, that is, we're going to see pre-orders go live for the Plastic Sakaran, 
And we've seen a couple of them surface online that the resin turrets from current Sicarians do fit on plastic Sicarians, but plastic turrets do not fit on resin Sicarians um, without a little bit of work. It's got the same sponsons as the Kratos, so all your magnetization efforts can work double time there. We're also going to get dropped the plastic Spartan assault tank, which will uh, allow people to add to that. The plastic contemptor with extra arms. Uh, the ability to buy the new frame with conversion beamer, plasma cannon, carries assault cannon, full kite dual culverin, spare power fist, chain fist blades, and loads of cosmetic goodies is also separately sold. The Leviathan shooty dreadnought is going to come out, and that gun platform or the gun sprue can be ordered separately. Cataphracty and Tartaros in 10 man squads will be available. The Legion Praetors from the main box will be available separately to buy. Forge World will be dropping the Iron Warriors upgrades finally. I wanted to buy uh, some of those. The Armagers are getting a re release. They're called Age of Darkness Armagers now, and they're just getting a decal sheet. Deckles. I know, I'm a, I'm a decal. Um, and, and, and the big one. The big one. The reason we're getting Armagers and the fancy decal sheet is Libra Mechanicum is getting both a physical and digital release at the same time. So you don't have to buy both, but I'm definitely going to buy one. Also, there's a bunch of books. One of them kind of tangentially heresy related might be, um, there's an Aeronautica book coming out. There's a, a couple of Warhammer crime novels that are coming out that looks kind of neat. The, the Aeronautica thing was interesting because they basically are, it's a new rule book and model releases, right? So I, that's the, that's the book or the, the game book, but there's also a audio book that's coming out. For oh, 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 sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that, did we talk about that? Was that before the last recording? Cause the... we, yeah. We talked about a little bit last recording that basically um, George was going to work on heresy Aeronautica. Cause we were in a slump last year, the year before last. And um Adepticon got canceled, but everyone still bought a bunch of Aeronautica stuff, and now we're finally getting releases for that. Yeah, cool. That's all pre-orders next week. Uh, available right now for pre-order is Mar Marduk Cedrus uh, with his wonky sword, uh, the Dark Angel heads and shoulder pads, uh, and then for a limited time is a bunch of White Scars and Emperor's Children shoulder pads and chests, and then the much memed upon Space Wolves heads and shoulder pads. Um, <laughs> now, before we get into this, let's preface this with a simple, basic statement. None of us like these heads. There's not a single one of us in this group who likes these heads. Even the, like my spa Space Wolf hoser, like super best friend, the, and he, that plays 40k that these heads would fit did not think they were that impressive so the positive here's the positive i think people should take out of it that they have to miss something every now and again so this is the one miss out of all the heresy releases so far is well the these and, and that's, the, a, that's okay the these and the praetor with like all the the gold coins all over them i think oh, Ash guy. yeah yeah i I, I feel bad for Space Wolves. They have gotten the short end of the Forge World stick. I don't oh, know yes. if, if someone is just not, a, is the, the guy who's who's in charge of Forge World, Space Wolves is just not a big fan of them or it's given to the last guy or something. But it seems that, you know, we, we can obviously talk about all the other memes that have come out of this. Banana fur was the beginning. <laughs> the iron sights being on the bottom of the bolter was another one. Those are, those are underslung red dots, sir. Uh, underslung oh, yeah. red dots. Oh, geez. It was so bad. The baghead. Don't forget the baghead. Bag the I could see the the baghead wasn't terrible. Um, I actually like the baghead for like one or two dudes in an army or like an it. entire squad of death one. Yeah, yeah, I like it. Um, I think it was pulled off better in the metal uh, redemptionist priests when they did that release in two th early two thousand, where they had um, some hockey masks, some bag heads, some dudes that were literally just carved sinner and helot and things like that in their foreheads. Those were so much better heads than the, as far as bag wise, uh, than the space one. Yeah, those, uh, man, it's just, I, it's I, just really, I really feel sad for him because Lehman Russ, the model for Lehman Russ is, is a beautiful, gorgeous model. Yes, and, right. when, and when painted up, it's it's beautiful. But, uh, and their contemptor is really not bad either. Their contemptor is uh, fantastic. The Lehman Russ is beautiful. Their uh, decal sheet is, I would argue, say one of the best decal sheets that they that they put put out. I'll agree there. It's it, it, it's, it's just you get these random misses with them that doesn't make any sense. Uh, the um, 
was it Gray Slayer upgrade kits? Those look good. The uh, Vergnar, Vagnar, Vagnar. I hope I'm not demonetized. Vagar Terminators. Um, they look good. Like, you know, not as tied to some of the other ones, but they're, uh, they're acceptable. It's just they get random stuff like bananas. Yeah. Not even bananas for scale, just bananas. Uh, the other release that's coming up for pre order, as Dan alluded to a little bit earlier, is the Kill Team box. Obviously, this isn't perfectly heresy. Uh, it's called Kill Team Into the Dark. Um, in the box is a kill team of Imperial Naval officers, uh, Kroot. But the other really cool part is 54 individual parts to make a ZM table. These parts are a lot thinner than the existing Necromunda ZM. Uh, and they're, they say that they're going to be released later. I'll probably picking up a set, couple sets of the terrain just to add on to my large they, collection of ZM parts. But they, they also said important. that there's like three months from now, there's going to be an expansion to the, the parts too. Yeah, and they say, and they may be thinner than the the ZM walls that came with the original ZM box, but they fit the aesthetic still, right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot. on the table as a, a Space Hulk or ZM board is, uh, you know, they're gonna look good, right? Because I, you know, I plan on expanding that all together. I've got three D printed walls and the Necromunda stuff and this stuff, and you know, just keep building out and building out further. And I've got the spaceship interior. Uh, fat mat old fat mat so you know eventually you know i'll just be able to have like the whole table full of zm is what i'm aiming for or at least half necromunda buildings and half zm at least they also took a cue from uh death world or sorry uh, death ray designs uh zm style and that these are highly modular uh they all have a three post key system and the top post has a little notch on it which is slots under a top cap that goes on the end of every every line so these are insanely modular you don't have to glue them together like you do the necromunda ones that i'm going to work on uh, i've seen some people make those modular but it's always a chore it's always you have to make some type of sacrifice somewhere these ones you don't have to glue anything at all it's completely modular all the time They're yeah well i i have to say the one of the things in and you pointed it out to me the the guy that's been designing a lot of this stuff and you've been following on uh, social media and uh, all of this stuff, it fits together and is sized and is modular. I mean, they they really have, have turned it into a terrain system rather mm -hmm. than just a bunch of terrain for a bunch of games. And, you know, that is uh, amazingly well thought out and a, a change from the way Games Workshop had run things for years and years and years in a very good way. And so the fact that, you know, I can buy this and I can know that the height of these walls at least is going to be the same height that the walls were in Necromunda and they're going to look good together and all that kind of stuff. So I, you know, <laughs> contrasting the Space Wolf heads, <laughs> it's not a miss there. They're actually doing a really good job with the train and building this train up. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a good thing. And like I said, I... I don't know that I'll play Kill Team at all, and, you know, but it was not a hard decision to order that box set <laughs> at all for knowing how much Heresy players like ZM and I need to fill mm -hmm. out my ZM board more. So, Absolutely. I've got, I've got to say this. Um, pretty much all of their recent terrain that I've seen or touched or had in my hands or on a table in front of me has been knocking it out of the park. Um they have seriously stepped up the quality on all of that so much that it's ridiculous. The uh, only and, complaint I have had has been the the Ashway stuff is a little expensive. Yeah, like I, that's the only one I can complain about. It, it's, so, so, it's 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 good stuff. It's just it's perfect. expensive. Yeah. So bringing up the price point, yep, that's fair. Yep. But then you compare it to the various MDF manufacturers. Yep. You compare it to the various other plastic terrain manufacturers and. I'm just amazed at the level of detail and lately modular uh, construction that we've been seeing out of all of this. And it all just seems to blend together really well in the aesthetic that we all kind of assume as the Games Workshop style, 40K style, 30K style aesthetic. And it's just, unlike Space Wolf has, it's a knockout of the park. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm not sure because like, I have the original Zomertalis box in like upon release, or not Zomer, uh, Necromunda box on release. And the cardboard stuff was really bad, right? It, you know, 
basically you looked at it funny and they curl up and warp and you can't lay it down flat on the table. So that's the one thing that has been my only in again, the price, right? So, you know, it, it is expensive to do a lot of these tables and the, the ash wastes, Ewok looking stuff is very expensive, but it's all really cool. And it's, you know, it just, it is what you're get what you're getting is what you're getting and it all fits together and works together and looks good. And yeah, it's definitely a plus. So the key things with a lot of those terrain sets is that if you buy the individual parts, they're usually horrendously expensive. But if you get in on the like launch box or whatever, when they first put it out, it's a big, it's a big ticket buy, but usually in, if you piece out everything individually, you end up coming out ahead. Well, and that, and that's part of the reason why I went ahead and ordered the, that kill team box right up front, because that's exactly what I've seen. And, and again, like I said, you know, it was, I, I, I don't see them fitting in an army, but the, the Imperial Navy dudes that come with them, and I didn't even know what army they go in in 40 K. I'm not even sure, but um, they just are, the ecstatic is good. You know, there was, uh, wasn't there dudes in, in the old zone Mortalis rules that you could buy um, that like had oxygen suits on and could go around and shoot guns and, help you um see so, yeah there was there was um uh you could buy a when back when they had like points you could spend in zm okay. you could buy yeah some arms men you could buy a firefly robot which yeah was, robots yeah so even so even even you know they fit the arms men's look in my mind when i saw it you know of what you know those guys would have looked like so i you know um the being able to have them and use them as as npcs or non-combatant combatants and special missions or something like that you know i just everything about it said you know i'm going to use this for heresy and i'm buying it and again the price point is a lot better if you're buying the big set up front and to go with to expand on the the everything looks alike they they also look a lot like the uh, what they called Rogue Trader, which was the first release of Kill Team, came with a set of armsmen and the goodest boy in the Imperium, uh, a doggo. Doggo. And um, a couple other things. I think it was like another robot and a bunch of ugly, weird Nurgle stuff. But um, these guys have a lot of the same aesthetics as those models, even though those were custom um, armsmen for that special Rogue Trader girl, uh, woman. That These ones match with the, that aesthetic as well a lot. Uh, some of the, the last guns aren't as quite ornate, but a lot of the suiting features look the same which is what's important yeah oh awesome so we're booking right along but about an hour um we have one more topic that we kind of wanted to discuss which was a bit about fluff in the ultramarines legion uh we figured since this is a <laughs> a lot of ultramarine players on this podcast we'd start with the most populous uh Pike Duncan uh showing his displeasure he said, he said populous not popular yeah <laughs> Number one lead, no. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what um. That's See, what I, I don't. Told. I don't personally consider them number one. I personally consider them number two. That was like they get both of the hands, <laughs> and both of the fingers. So childish. You're yeah. darn right. It's what I'm known for. So um, obviously, I started Ultramarines uh, when I started 40k. It was back in third edition. Uh, the semi-Roman aesthetic that was starting back then uh, that has really matured into a very heavy Roman aesthetic with you know boarding shields and uh, the everyone having gladiuses uh really is what kind of drew me into the ultramarines um when you look at the fluff wise uh Gulliman starting out you know on what originally you know uh, mccrag was kind of a an offbeat world it really didn't start out as uh very technologically heavy it was more you know warring clans and having to unite a bunch of different factions he didn't have a lot of space travel but has now become, you know, Gulliman was able to unite all 500 worlds before the Imperium got there. You know, the fluff has changed a little bit in that way. When you look at what's been expanded upon since the heresy started, you know, with Rubio being picked up as part of uh, Malkador's lot, that was the really the first inkling we got of Ultramarines in the heresy was uh, that original short story of uh, Garrow going to uh, McCrag to pick up or no, to Cal to pick up to pick up Rubio. Then we started getting expansions into the Avenging Sun timeline with you know the destruction of Cal, um, the large paint fight with Gulliman playing the role of Horus, and then slowly building up into everyone trying to figure out how to kill Marines better with 
what's his name? The redhead, the red mask guy. Ammon Seal. Yep. Thank you. Um, for being censored for what would later that day be the most important trait that anyone could have, uh, being able to think about killing other space marines. Uh, and then Gulliman getting bombed out of his own flagship, blown into space, and being such a baller that he could just walk around in space with no problem without a helmet and punch people to death in space, come back on board and rerouting the whole word bearers and, and beginning to take back Calf. Uh, then that leads into the only heresy graphic novel we've gotten which was um mccrag's honor uh based up, obviously based upon the flagship going out through the warp to try to catch corfair on uh and then we get gulliman building the unremembered empire conscripting sanguinius and the lion to rule with him uh and then the breakout from the 500 worlds into the storm and uh, armatura fighting both lorgar and pre-demon angron at the same time and Angron's rebirth as a demon primarch on that world, and then slowly, you know, trying to push the Terra and having issues there, uh, which is kind of where we've left Gulliman. You know, the, he's trying to get to Terra, he's trying to to break through, and obviously Horus is really scared, worried about, you know, what force he's going to bring to bear as everyone comes through. Yeah, it's interesting because you say you started with Ultramarines in 40k, and I, when I came to Heresy, I, when I played 40k, I despised ultramarines it was like the last army i was ever going to play and i played magmanus warriors as codex vanilla marines that followed the codex because they they were just post padab and they were you know trying to get back in favor of the emperor but i always you know the whole perfection prime example of space marines of ultramarines things really turned me off and when i started reading the lore and getting into the lore and the background and everything and realized that you know the ultramarines in horus heresy times are way flawed right for all of for all of what they built up and did um they're not really any better than any other legion as far as you know they made mistakes they did things that you know they were vain about a lot of stuff they you know um like you said they didn't think about you know, they thought about every possibility of killing every enemy except for other space marines, which, you know, at some point that, you know, really hurt hurt them. Um, you know, that the whole story in that heresy is completely different than what I think it is in 40k. And even to the point, right, we didn't talk about um monarchia and you know, one of the things oh, yeah. that I think was a huge um mistake but uh draws me to ultramarines is when they went with the emperor and you know they brought the all the ultramarines and they had all the word bears and they had to get down on their knee in front of gilman and all the ultramarines and that whole scene and i just see that play out in my head and it's like you know it's it's they were they were being the emperor's tool <laughs> in a lot of ways for what he was doing and took you know took the brunt of it for it in the long run but you know it definitely was you know, help shape who ultramarines are in my mind and see all that. So I, uh, um, yeah, so, that's that's part of the reason I was drawn to them actually is is the, all the the fact that they aren't perfect and they definitely have character and flaws and a lot of that stuff. Yeah, the um, Gulliman book goes a little bit more into post monarchia Gulliman's thoughts, and he kind of reflects the fact that he he didn't want to have it done, but because the emperor said this is what needs to be done. He's like, all right, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, dad wants it to be done. It's got to be done. It's less Dorn, uh, I will follow whatever dad says, and, and a little more, uh, yeah. he feels more bad about it than Dorn would, I guess. I also love one of the things, and in, in it's so Ultramarines, and um, I forget which book it finally ends, but when they start the Mark of Calf, and it's like T-0-100 is the battle, and it's like, 14 yeah. years later when Remus Venteris Vernatus uh finally like kills the last word bearer or whatever, you know, the that they end the the mark of Calf and they basically are running the whole battle clock the whole time and everything is based off of that battle clock. I just that's that's a cool thing to me. I think it's really neat. One of the one of the things in the lore that I just think is awesome. Yeah, that was something I kind of missed was the Ultramarines didn't get a lot of love in the beginning of the heresy, obviously, because there were other places. Uh, but when you look at, they were a little bit in battle for the abyss. I think there was like five or six of them in there. Uh, but when obviously Mark of, or Betrayal at Calf, the box game dropped for heresy 1.0, uh, 
there was a, a slew of little novels that came out from there was a pair of novels that came out with that box drop that were written one from the ultramarine side one from the world leader side or word bearer side where they um talked about the 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 war on calf and what happened there and then there was a couple of short story there was a there was a whole anthology set on calf um and then there's been a graphic novel and a few books but um ultramarines have actually gotten a lot of representation as far as books are concerned either being the main characters or being uh, part of their own books because of the whole the pharaoh's device was another one um they had a they had a few in the 40k battle series yeah i mean they've had tons of books available yeah well, and they, they're 40K, they have a ton of books i've been i've been catching up on some of the books and their characters show you know there's an ultramarine character in this book and that book uh, and a lot of different books too um one of the one of the interesting things and this is my personal backstory for my ultramarine so i because i played manis warriors um i i looked into it a little bit and the world that becomes badab is in the 500 worlds and so the whole badab war is fought in the outskirts of what is the 500 worlds so in my mind i i wanted to build a night house i wanted to build a custom night house and I'm like, well, I, I want to be able to use it in both 40K if I play my Manus Warriors and in 30K if I play my Ultramarine. So I have my company of Ultramarines is the 89th company of Ultramarines, and they're stationed out in that area. And that allows me to have my custom night house be out in that area. And it makes sense that that same night house could still be operating and be around and serve the Manus Warriors, you know, 10,000 years later. Um, so, you know, that's one of my cool little um, narrative things that I've built into my Ultramarines. And so, you know, most of the time if I'm at an event and it's not some specific battle or something, uh, the story of my Ultramarines is they're, they're out there and that's those Ultramarines. So they are, you know, really running with, all the name characters and, and Gilliman and all that kind of stuff. They're kind of out there on their own way out away from everyone and just kind of, you know, trying to do their own thing. I can, I can dig. Um, my world leaders army is built around the battle of uh, Armatura and uh, they're not the guys who run, who, who are Karn's company, but uh, they're the guys who are mentioned in the book as I think it's 12th. I'm not really sure which one, but the, they're the guys who are running beside Karn's company towards the line of, uh, of ultramarine and victari or whatever they are to uh to hack down the guys with the shields and that uh in that brutal fight where um angron gets buried in the middle of the plaza and and i can happily and proudly state i have painted two ultramarines for my army um they decorate sorry three ultramarines for my army hmm. they decorate uh, angron's base really well and uh that's my total desire to paint anything ultramarine yeah, so yeah good. Now that I think about it, white would be a good contrast on the bases of some of my guys. I've been painting word bearers, but maybe I should switch it up. Well, and that, you know, and my, I think we talked about it before, but my word bearers are based on um, the word bearers at that, that, basically that same battle and that whole Shadow Crusade. And, you know, it's Argyll Tall and, uh, you know, his, his bodyguard that's all split up in different, you know, units that go along. So, you know, they, Basically, your your army and my army would all fight together. And you guys would be bitching because I'm coming in at the end and uh, letting you guys run like crazy men to start with. And then I'm coming in strategically afterwards. <laughs> I will say that um, I don't have a lot of love for word bearers. But there is one thing that I do like about the word bearers. And that's that they really socked it to the ultramarine. So, well done, Erebus. You mustache twirling goof. <laughs> So about you, Jack, what's your, uh, what drew you to Ultramarines and, and what's your take on the fluff and everything? Man, I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be an expert on any of the fluff. Um, I just know that when I picked up my first box of Marines and I saw the blue paint job with the, with the white shoulder pads and the red guns and the yellow trim, and I was like, that is actually really freaking cool looking. And then I went and did my due diligence and did a little bit of back work on them. And I was like, cool, they got a little bit of Roman aesthetic to them. Um, they, see, they seem kind of cool. Uh, everybody seemed to hate them. That is, that is where I want to go. And I wish I was kidding on this, but that's, <laughs> that's what, what did it for me. I'm like, man, um, everybody's going to talk smack. I love talking smack. 
let's do this. When I started uh, 40K back in the early 90s, the local group that was in Lexington, there were a couple Ultra Marines players who I didn't like back then and I don't like to this day. There were, there was a Space Wolf guy, a guy who was doing Dark Angels, and I did initially Blood Angels before the Chaos Codex dropped, and I converted over to Iron Warriors. And I have, this may sound bad, but I have never really liked that blue. I just, something about that blue armor and the various trims and everything about them has always just kind of, no, just it just doesn't speak to me in a way that I like. I've always liked the gold the best. But uh, when I was doing 40K, I, I had almost the whole chapter finished up before I sold it off. Uh, I had uh, the eighth and the fifth. And I think the fifth being the black rims probably looked the best, the second best compared to that gold. I liked the yellow when it was out, but when they swapped it to gold, man, that it made it pop so much more to me. If I get away with the yellow trim now, I would. <laughs> Not even lying. No, well, I mean, they're your guys. You can always paint them that way and just say that they're a different company. I know, but I'm a sucker for them. Um... You know, going, oh, well, we use this color now, so I'm guessing I'm using this color now. Mine are, mine are all bronze because I'm a 10 bits addict in or whatever the new 10 color bits. is. But, but there's you're, a, you're something, Dan. But luckily, it's it's been remade into a new color, so I can still use it. But uh, so I do all of my armor in, in, in that on all, all the blue. So I cheat when it comes to heresy. I used to paint it. Uh, you know, brown, and then I would do whatever gold I, I liked. I think mainly it was P3 roulette gold was a good, and then I'd kind of build up after that. And since changing to Heresy, I've really uh, just changed it up to be just a brown base coat, and then I go over it with rub and buff gold. Uh, it's a kind of a wax-based, uh, I don't want to call it a paint. It's more just like a chalk almost. It's so thick. Um, but it works so well for, for nice, br vibrant, popping gold. Uh, and that's really what I've used every, for every heresy model that I've done is I get a little bit of that uh, wax on whatever brush I don't like, and then I go to town with it. I can usually use the little disposable uh, purple, uh, green, and red. Um, we usually we all use them for airbrush cleaning, but they're mainly used, they claim, for nail nail painting. Um, and I can usually use those to, to apply the gold, but... Uh, it is not a paint that you can easily control, and that's why I like uh, kind of using it as that pop on all my golds. See, I really like using the gold, the artist's the acrylic ink. I do a, do a base coat of the deep gold, but I reinforce the color with the uh, Green Stuff World's uh, pure metallic pigments, the darker gold they have, and then I highlight it with the light gold with the lighter gold pigment that they have because it basically creates a one coat when you're done cool until recently i was doing my gold with an undercoat of brass a coat of uh one of the old gw golds that i have somewhere sitting around here and then um a two-part shade on top of that with uh a an orangish yellow from ghost from the minotaur ghost tint line and their uh, brown tint those two mixed together from the ghost tint line from Minotaur as well but uh recently I switched to just putting down a silver for whatever base metal color then going over it with necro gold from scale 75 or if I want it to be more of a reddish gold uh going over that with viking gold from from uh, scale 75 from their metal and alchemy line and it's been marvelous it, it's probably the best gold combination i've seen that i'm really liking for my stuff so i definitely understand where you're coming from on that though jamie you're the only one that hasn't talked about a gold recipe <laughs> um i i just use what uh it's on my gw or gw citadel painting system uh guides that they have that i stole that i got from the uh the store um i just i don't paint a whole lot of gold to be honest with you it now bolt gun metal and like Gun, uh, gun, you know, gunmetal type colors, yes. Gold, no. Um, maybe trim on Titans, but like usually it was older GW paints, like old, old, long discontinued colors that I would put down kind of a uh, a bronzy color first, and then go over the top of it with a thin down gold, so it would look a little bit more aged, which would still work with other paints too, but. You kind of use something more of a reddish or coppery color that'll show through the uh, the thin down gold. But I mean, I, I really don't paint a whole lot of gold. 
it's black, baby. It's all black all the time. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I have, you know, most of the armies I've worked on, I'm trying to think. All the Toys for Tots armies that I've worked on have been my, not much gold. It's all been like, uh, again, like silver metallics. Um, just because that's, you know, the more of the, her, the heresy aesthetic I, to me um, is weathered and played with kind of looking, um, uh, you know, I just don't paint a whole lot of gold. Sorry, I'm not more help. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine. But I guess with that, we've uh, covered everything we want to talk about. So uh, until next time, uh, stay accountable to your buddies. And this is John, and I've been joined by... And Duncan. Jack. And Jamie. <laughs> and have a great night.